Darkcast Network. Welcome to the dark side of podcasts. Content warning ahead. This podcast contains very sensitive topics such as missing persons, unsolved cases, haunted houses, and paranormal activity. These type of topics can contain very upsetting, sensitive details and stories. Please listen responsibly. Hey there, my name is Keely. I am the host of a true crime and paranormal podcast called Misty Mysteries. Today is a very special episode because I am teamed up with one of my fellow podcast friends from the Darkcast Network, Autumn of Autumn Odysseys. Autumn is going to tell you about the disappearance of Amelia Earhart, and I'll be telling you about the disappearance of American socialite Dorothy Arnold. First, I'm going to let Autumn take it away and tell you her story. Hey, hey, Keely. Thanks for having me. I'm Autumn of Autumn's Oddities, and I've got a tale that you may be familiar with. Well, I'm sure that if you are a sentient being that's lived any time roughly in the last century, maybe longer, if you're a vampire, you've heard of today's subject. It's one of the greatest mysteries in U.S. history, potentially even in the history of the world, that continues to fascinate aviation enthusiasts, truth seekers, amateur sleuths, pretty much Anyone at some point in their lives has been fascinated with this case. But while we all know that Amelia Earhart disappeared along with her plane, I have to admit that I personally knew almost nothing about her apart from that, which is kind of shameful because we've all heard her name, but I don't think very many of us know much about her other than that she was a pilot. On the morning of July 2nd, 1937, Amelia Earhart and her navigator, Fred Noonan, took off from Lai, New Guinea on one of the last legs of their historic attempt to circumnavigate the globe. Their next destination was Howland Island, which is in the central Pacific Ocean, some 2,500 miles away. A U.S. Coast Guard cutter, the Itasca, waited there to guide the world-famous aviator in for a landing on the tiny, uninhabited coral atoll. But Amelia Earhart never made it to Howland Island. Battling overcast skies, faulty radio transmissions, and a rapidly diminishing fuel supply in her twin-engine Lockheed Electra plane, she and Fred Noonan lost contact with the Itasca somewhere over the Pacific. So they had literally everything going against them. Despite a search and rescue mission of unprecedented scale, including ships and planes from the U.S. Navy and Coast Guard scouring some 250,000 square miles of ocean, neither they nor the plane wreckage was ever found. Her disappearance remains one of the greatest unsolved mysteries of the 20th century. In its official report at the time, the Navy concluded that Earhart and Noonan had just run out of fuel, crashed into the Pacific Ocean, and drowned. Simplest explanation, right? A court order declared Earhart legally dead in January of 1939, just 18 months after she disappeared. But from the beginning, debates have raged over actually what happened on the day she disappeared and afterward. Several different theories have surfaced, and many millions of dollars have been spent searching for evidence that could reveal what really happened to Earhart and Noonan. I'm sure we've all heard of her, but again, I have to admit, I don't know much, if anything, about her personal life. I know that Amelia Earhart was an American aviator who set many flying records and championed the advancement of women in aviation. She became the first woman to fly solo across the Atlantic Ocean and the first person ever to fly solo from Hawaii to the United States mainland. But before she was world famous, Amelia Mary Earhart was born in Atchison, Kansas on July 24th, 1897. She defied traditional gender roles from a young age, playing basketball, taking an auto repair course, and even briefly attending college. Ooh, the scandal. And good for her. I mean, all jokes aside, that must have been an uphill battle every step of the way. This is very, very different times. So during World War I, she served as a Red Cross nurse's aide in Toronto, Canada, and it was during her time in service that Earhart began watching pilots in the Royal Flying Corps training at the local airfield, and she was absolutely fascinated by them. After the war, she returned to the United States and enrolled at Columbia University in New York as a pre-med student. So not only was She just like way ahead of her time. She was also really freaking smart. Earhart took her first airplane ride in California in December of 1920 with famed World War I pilot Frank Hawks, and she was forever hooked. In January of 1921, she started flying lessons with female flight instructor Netta Snook. Awesome name. 
To help pay for those lessons, Earhart worked as a filing clerk at the Los Angeles Telephone Company. Later that year, she purchased her first airplane, which was a secondhand yellow Kenner Airster that she she nicknamed the Canary. Earhart passed her flight test in December of 1921, earning a National Aeronautics Association license. Just two days later, she participated in her first flight exhibition at the Sierra Aerodrome in Pasadena, California. She was ready. She got that license. She's like, bitch, I don't care. I got this two days ago. I'm going to compete. So Amelia Earhart set a number of aviation records, like I said, in her short career as a pilot. Her first record came in 1922 when she became the first woman to fly solo above 14,000 feet. In 1932, she became the first woman and the second person only after Charles Lindbergh to fly solo across the Atlantic Ocean. She left Newfoundland, Canada on May 20th in a red Lockheed Vega 5B. I don't know what that is. Um, I know it's a plane. I don't really know what it looks like. I'm just reading it to you. And arrived a day later, landing in a cow field near, near Londonderry in Northern Ireland. Upon returning to the United States, she was awarded the Congressional Distinguished Flying Cross, which is a military decoration awarded for heroism or extraordinary achievement while participating in aerial flight. She was the first woman to ever receive that honor. So she was a trailblazer in seemingly every sense of the word. Later that year, Earhart made the first solo nonstop flight across the United States by a woman. She started in Los Angeles and landed 19 hours later in Newark, New Jersey. She also became the first person to fly solo from Hawaii to the United States mainland in 1935. I know I said that already. I'm just going chronologically now. So Earhart worked tirelessly to promote opportunities for women in aviation. And in 1929, after placing third in the All Women's Air Derby, which was actually the first transcontinental air race for women, Earhart helped to form the 99s, like the year 1999, an international organization for the advancement of female pilots. She became the first president of the Organization of Licensed Pilots, which still exists today and represents women flyers from 44 countries. On June 1st, 1937, Amelia Earhart took off from Oakland, California on an eastbound flight around the world. This was her second attempt to become the first pilot ever to circumnavigate the globe and the eyes of the world were upon her. She flew a twin-engine Lockheed 10E Electra and was accompanied on the flight by her navigator, Fred Noonan. They flew to Miami, then down to South America, across the Atlantic to Africa, then east to India and to Southeast Asia. On July 2nd, 1937, Earhart and Noonan departed Lai, which was in Papua New Guinea, for the longest stretch. Their destination was Howland Island, a tiny one and a half mile by half mile wide atoll rising a mere 20 feet from the South Pacific. So this is a tiny, tiny little island in which to land a very fast moving plane onto. So a little bit nerve wracking. They had around 7,000 miles left in their journey, which, you know, that sounds like a lovely little jaunt as compared to the 22,000 miles they'd already flown. God, that's so many. I was making sure I read that right because that sounds like such a fucking long number. This 24-hour flight to Howland covered about 2,500 miles. And after they abandoned every unnecessary item on board the plane, they still had only just enough fuel to make it to Howland. So... They are cutting it very close. There could be no margin for error. And to ensure their safety, a Coast Guard cutter, the Itasca, tracked them using radio. And two additional ships burned all of their lights to serve as markers along the route. Noonan tried to use celestial navigation to find his way, but the skies were overcast during that stretch. The pair also fell out of radio contact with the Coast Guard. After dawn, the Itasca picked up a transmission from Earhart saying that by Noonan's reckoning, the plane should be just over the Itasca. It was more just off Howland Island, but Earhart said their fuel stores were running low. An hour later, another radio transmission came from Earhart saying, quote, we are running north and south. So that was the last transmission. Earhart and Noonan were never heard from again. So, President Franklin D. Roosevelt authorized a massive two-week search for the pair by the U.S. Navy, covering some 250,000 square miles, or if you use kilometers, 647,497. 
Yeah. Square kilometers of ocean and spending $4 million in the midst of the Great Depression to find evidence of Earhart and Noonan's fate. Although searchers scoured Howland Island and the surrounding sea, no wreckage was discovered. It was as if Earhart and Noonan simply vanished into thin air. Once attention turned from Howland Island in the years to follow, however, potential clues to the disappearance of Earhart and Noonan began turning up. Scholars and aviation enthusiasts have proposed many theories about what happened to Amelia Earhart. The official position from the United States government is that Earhart and Noonan crashed into the Pacific Ocean and that they are deceased. But there are numerous theories regarding their disappearance, some a little more plausible than others. Inevitably, in the midst of mystery, our minds tend to fill in the blanks, and it seems to be in our nature to establish a cause for every event and to have some sort of finality. And the disappearance of Amelia and Fred is no different. But what are the odds of her plane ever actually being discovered? Since there seem to be no answers, imaginations have run wild and concocted outlandish theories to explain their disappearance. To some, 39-year-old Earhart was an American spy sent to carry out espionage against the Japanese, who eventually caught and executed her, even though the Japanese aided in the search effort for them in the following days of the disappearance and have denied anything to that effect. To others, she survived the mission and was forced to become Tokyo Rose, the infamous wartime radio personality. Perhaps the most bizarre theory out there is that she secretly returned to the United States and assumed the identity of Irene Cragmile Bolum, a wealthy New Jersey banker and housewife. This is, of course, not to mention my favorite theory that she was abducted by aliens. Yeah, this is this is like a serious theory. Even those who take more scientific approaches to the Earhart disappearance tend to maintain a certain fervent dedication to uncovering her final whereabouts. Various private expeditions with multi-million dollar price tags have been carried out in the decades since the U.S. Navy called off its search in July of 1937. And despite the use of increasingly sophisticated sonar technology to scour the ocean depths and modern archaeological techniques to comb tiny islands, the fate of Earhart and Noonan remains undetermined. This isn't to say that no evidence has been uncovered, nor that searchers are likely to give up their pursuit of the truth about the Earhart mystery. I personally think, let's get James Cameron on it. Um, he put so much freaking money into finding the Titanic. It's unreal. So why don't we just go ahead and get James Cameron on it? He can make a whole ass movie about it that I may or may not want to watch because it'll be five hours long. But let's get into some theories, shall we? The most popular and maybe the most plausible theory is that Earhart's Electra ran out of fuel, crashed into the ocean, and was swallowed by the sea. Danforth Pewter, CEO of Bram Kleppner, yeah, I said that right, I think, Bram Kleppner, interesting, who is Earhart's great nephew, was born a few years after she died. He and his mother believe that the best theory is the simplest one in the absence of any evidence to the contrary. The theory, which is also endorsed by the United States government, is that Earhart and navigator Fred Noonan crashed into the Pacific Ocean while attempting to reach Howland Island, approximately 946 miles from the Marshall Islands. In 2002 and 2006, deep sea company Nauticos looked for Earhart's plane near the spot where she last radioed, but their efforts yielded no findings, unfortunately. Now let's get into the Gardner Island castaway hypothesis. All of the hypotheses have names. So the International Group for Historic Airway or Aircraft Recovery, or TIGHAR for short, because I'm not saying that entire title every time, hypothesizes that Earhart and Noonan veered off course from Howland Island and landed instead roughly 350 miles to the southwest on Gardner Island on what is now called Niku Mororo in the Republic of Kiribati. The island was uninhabited at the time that the plane disappeared. A week after Earhart's disappearance, Navy planes flew over the island. They noted recent signs of habitation, but found no evidence of an airplane. Toward the end of the search for Earhart in 1937, the Navy sent a destroyer to an uninhabited atoll called Gardner Island, and they their radio transmissions on the frequency Earhart had been using were being broadcast sporadically from that area. The search was called off after two observation planes launched from the ship turned up no evidence of human life. Okay, perhaps that would have been the end of the association between Earhart and the island. 
had it not been colonized by the British just a year after her disappearance. In 1940, Gerald Gallagher, the lead official on the island, discovered evidence that a castaway had inhabited the island before it was colonized. Among the finds were the sole of a woman's shoe, a man's shoe, a liquor bottle, a container for a sextant, which is a navigational device, a human skull, and bones. Tighar believes that Earhart and Noonan lived for a time as castaways on the waterless atoll, relying on rain squalls for drinking water and eventually dying on the island. The main issue with this theory is, like I said, Navy planes searched the only four mile long island on July 9th, 1937, without seeing Earhart, Noonan, or the plane. Since 1988, several Tighar expeditions to the island have turned up artifacts and anecdotal evidence in support of this hypothesis. At an area on the island known as the Seven Site, something that appears to be a castaway camp was found. And some of the artifacts include a piece of plexiglass that may have come from the Electra's window. Giant clamshell fragments suggest a shell was smashed open. A cache of bones of turtles, fish, and birds display evidence of having been exposed to fire. So maybe they, you know, did a little fishing, cooked it over a fire. Also, the remains of a woman's compact and a jar that once held a cream for lightning freckles, uh, both from the 1930s, were found. And in the remains of the village on Gardner, which was left uninhabited once more in 1963 after a long drought, crafts made by residents out of aluminum aircraft metal were left behind. In June of 2017, a Tighar-led expedition arrived on Niku Mororo with four forensically trained bone-sniffing border collies. So sweet-ass band name, bone-sniffing border collies, to search the island for any skeletal remains of Earhart or Noonan. The search turned up no bones or DNA belonging to either. You're going to hear me say something in a couple of minutes that sounds contradictory. It's not. Someone, a professor is making some really out there claims. They literally have no bones or DNA to test, but they're out there making some some pretty pretty large claims. So in August of 2019, Robert Ballard, the ocean explorer known for locating the wreck of the Titanic, <laughs> he and James Cameron, I'm sure, are like best friends, led a team to search for Earhart's plane in the waters around Niku Mororo. They saw no signs of the Electra. And I'd say if anyone was going to find her plane, it would be that guy. These findings of items that possibly belong to Earhart have led to many groups seeing Niku Mororo as the key to solving the mystery, so much so that in 2019, here, here we have the professor, Professor Richard L. Jantz from the University of Tennessee claims that the bone fragments found on the island during the initial search were indeed those of Amelia Earhart. He claims that the bones were initially ruled out as those of Earhart after a first examination concluded they were male. Professor Jantz has argued that forensic techniques were not fully developed at the time, and they weren't, and that bone measurements closely match Earhart's records. The remains were examined by the principal of the <laughs> Central Medical School in Fiji of the Dr. D.W. Hoodness. Yeah, okay. That's an interesting name. Who concluded they belonged to a stocky male around five foot five inches. The human remains found on Gardner Island were lost after being examined by that same doctor. And that rules out definitive DNA matching technology that would likely determine conclusively whether the bones are Earhart's or Noonan's or neither. Forensic anthropologists looked at the doctor's notes in the 1990s and determined that the bones probably belong to a woman of European descent. So... Uh, I, I don't agree with this professor, but as the, as bones have since been lost, Professor Jantz used the bone measurements taken by Dr. Hoodless and compared them with what is known of Earhart's body type. Jantz was able to piece together Earhart's bone measurements by using her photos along with her driver's and pilot's license records. Summing up the process, he said, if the skeleton were available, it would presumably be a relatively straightforward task to make a positive identification or a definitive exclusion. Unfortunately, all we have are the meager data in Hoodless's report and a pre-mortem record gleaned from photographs and clothing. From the information available, we can at least provide an assessment of how well the bones fit what we can reconstruct of Amelia Earhart. Professor Jantz claimed that in 1940, osteology was not yet a well-developed discipline, leading Hoodless to incorrectly assign the gender of the remains. His own studies showed that the bones were closer to the measurements of Earhart than 99% of a very large sample size. 
Jans concluded, until definitive evidence is presented that the remains are not those of Amelia Earhart, the most convincing argument is that they are hers. Uh, how? How? That's not a convincing argument. I'm not buying it. I don't think it's her. Uh, I also don't like that this guy, his whole argument is just like, unless you can't prove that this is Amelia Earhart's bones, then these are in fact her bones. Like that's his whole argument. He's just like, no, you can't prove otherwise. He's never seen her fucking bones. He's never tested them. He's never touched them. Nothing. They are lost. I know. Just sit down, guy. Sit the fuck down. He's trying to be the one to solve this. It ain't it. Another theory is that Earhart and Noonan, unable to find Howland Island to refuel, headed north to the Japanese-controlled Marshall Islands, where they were captured. In 2017, investigators announced the discovery of a photo buried in the National Archives for nearly 80 years that they believe depicted Earhart and Noonan just days after their disappearance. Retired federal agent Les Kinney scoured the National Archives for any records related to the case, and he was the one that uncovered the photo from the Office of Naval Intelligence, or ONI, which the investigators believe shows Earhart and Noonan alive on a dock in the Marshall Islands right after they disappeared. The photo also shows a Japanese ship towing a barge with an airplane on the back, which was believed to be Earhart's Electra. However, the photo was later debunked, and Japanese authorities told NBC that there are no records indicating that Earhart was ever in Japanese custody. Also part of the conspiracy theory that Earhart was taken prisoner by the Japanese was that the United States was at war, obviously, in 1942, and Earhart's flight brought her right over enemy territory, and that is a pretty good point. It only made sense then, you know, conspiracy theory wise, that the U.S. government should use her as a Trojan horse to spy on the Japanese. They allege that Earhart was instructed to ditch her plane over the Marshall Islands just off the Japanese coast so that the Navy could come to her rescue, gain access to the Japanese waters and conduct reconnaissance. The U.S. eventually invaded and occupied the islands in 1944. In this version of the conspirator spy thriller, Earhart's plane was shot down. The Japanese knew that she was an American spy and treated her accordingly in this version of events. There is no agreement on whether Earhart was beheaded at Garapon Prison or merely died there of dysentery. But either way, in this version of the story, she dies in a Japanese prison. And during World War II, close to 12 English-speaking women broadcast Japanese propaganda over the radio to taunt, traumatize, and confuse American soldiers. So psychological warfare. The Americans called these women Tokyo Rose. So it wasn't just one woman. It was roughly 12. After Earhart's disappearance, rumors began to spread that she had been captured by the Japanese and was being forced to read their propaganda. Her husband, George Putnam, personally investigated the reports, but could not recognize his wife's voice among the many Tokyo Roses. Here's an interesting theory. Um, Earhart was known to not be a fan of celebrity. She did not like being famous. And in 1943, a film called Flight for Freedom used that knowledge to suggest that Earhart was in love with Fred Noonan and that she had faked her death in order to elope with him. The film focused on a fictional protagonist whose story echoed Earhart's, but influenced dozens of real biographies about her. There is no solid evidence that Earhart was having an affair, and it was her husband who pressured her to take Noonan on that flight. But the romantic notion that Earhart faked her own death to follow her heart apparently still resonates with some to this day. Another popular theory puts forth a rather creative solution to the mystery. Author W.C. Jameson wrote in Amelia Earhart, Beyond the Grave, that he had interviewed the nephew of a former U.S. Army official who said it's just common knowledge in high-ranking intelligence circles that Earhart was involved in an intelligence gathering operation. Another author, Joseph Gervais, claimed in Amelia Earhart Lives that she survived the plane crash, was taken prisoner, and after World War II, that she repatriated to New Jersey, taking the name Irene Bolam and becoming a banker. Despite the fact that Bolam herself, because this is a real person, denied being Earhart and sued for one and a half million dollars, I guess it was a defamation suit, people still latched onto this theory. 
Critics of the spy theory point out that no government documents supporting the idea that Earhart was a U.S. spy have ever been found, and probably by this point they would have been declassified, whether in Roosevelt's papers or in Army and Navy intelligence files from World War II. Let's get into the good stuff. The area of the South Pacific where Earhart disappeared is reportedly a hotbed for alien activity. Conspiracy theorists imagine that the Easter Island heads were built by aliens using lasers, that skyscrapers were built by extraterrestrials at the bottom of the Pacific, you know, the Great Pyramids. People couldn't have possibly built those, had to have been ancient aliens, and that the frog-like statues of Marquesa Island depict an ancient alien race. On August 28th, 1995, another team of explorers voyaged into the unknown, and they did find Amelia Earhart. And that was the USS Voyager, Captain Catherine Janeway. She came across eight humans frozen in a death-like coma and brushed the dust off one of the humans' jackets. And that's when she discovered... A. Earhart embroidered on it. She had been abducted by aliens. So in other words, Star Trek Voyager posited the theory that Earhart had been abducted by aliens. That episode aired in 1995, and it was based on that premise. Uh, I've seen it in lots of TV shows and movies, and the same fate was also shown in American Horror Story Double Feature in the episode Take Me to Your Leader, where Earhart has been held by aliens in cooperation with the U.S. government at Area 51 in order to bear a child that is a hybrid alien human, the perfect being, but the pregnancy fails and Earhart is killed. And let's be honest. This is the most likely explanation for what happened to her. And I'm kidding. I'm totally kidding. Don't turn this episode off. I don't believe this one at all. It's a lot of fun. With so many pieces of evidence, including human remains that allegedly belong to her, perhaps the biggest obstacle to discovery is the vast geographic area in which Earhart's plane might be lost in. No one knows for sure exactly where her plane went down because of the loss of radio contact during the flight and the limiting effect of the overcast skies on celestial navigation. They could have been very far off their course, but believed that they were like right on top of it. Combing a quarter of a million square miles of ocean immediately following the disappearance yielded exactly nothing for the Navy. While subsequent efforts have focused on smaller areas, the searchable canvas remains absolutely massive, often on the order of a thousand square miles or 2,590 square kilometers. I know I have listeners outside of the United States. I know we're the only ones in the world that use a completely made up system of measurement and numbers. So I will always try to convert if I can, if I remember. I mean, that's a lot of square gra- or a lot of square miles to cover, but it's strange that after decades and massive efforts put in by both private citizens, like just spending shit tons of money and the U.S. government, that nothing has been found. The area's marine topography makes what's already a needle in a haystack task even more difficult as Pacific atolls rise up suddenly from the depths and are surrounded by steep shelves that lead to the ocean floor. Human error has also thrown a wrench in many efforts, you know, as we saw with the loss of the bones of what could have been Amelia Amelia Earhart. Like, who the hell lost what could have potentially been her bones? I hope they fired that friggin' person. These obstacles haven't deterred Earhart fans and aviation nerds from continuing their quest for answers. Tighar is set to launch a 30-day expedition in mid-September, exploring the waters around Nikumoro Island in an oceanographic... I say that right? Oceanographic research ship. Searchers plan to deploy two human-operated submersiles. Whoa. No. Submersibles. Oh, my God. What the hell's wrong with me? I swear I can read. I'm wearing my glasses today, and the peripheral vision in them is atrocious. I am nearly legally blind. So, like, I'm, yeah, I'm doing my best here. Sorry, you guys. So, they're going to launch submersibles. We got it. From the ship to capture detailed photo and video images of a one mile, 1.6 kilometer search area. At the same time, another team will comb the island's beachfront and forest in search of remnants from what may have been Earhart and Noonan's campsite. I feel like at this point, they're just beating the shit out of a dead horse. Searchers have continued to find significant clues. In 2013, Tighar announced that it had used sonar imaging to uncover evidence of a 22-foot or 7-meter object that may be a piece of Earhart's aircraft, or literally 
any other aircraft that's crashed done the exact same thing. Resting 600 feet or 183 meters below the surface of the Pacific Ocean and west of Niku Mororo, the image resembles the fuselage of Earhart's Lockheed Electra. Uh, spoiler, it wasn't because that was in 2013. So we know now, you know, roughly almost 10 years later, nine years, that um, no, it was not her plane. People, like, they get a glimpse of something. It's kind of like Nessie, the search for Nessie. That's what I'm going to like in the search for Amelia Earhart and her plane. It's like the search for Nessie. They find, like, the smallest tidbit of something, and it gives them hope to continue on. There's good reason to believe that all or most of the plane remains intact. An hour before their last transmission, Earhart told the Coast Guard that she and Noonan were flying at a low altitude around 1,000 feet or 304 meters at around 100 miles per hour, 161 kph. The Lockheed Electra could conceivably have maintained its integrity, so it may have stayed in one piece in the event of a crash. If it did, the plane may still be in perfect condition, preserved in the oxygen-deprived depths of the South Pacific. Maybe sooner rather than later, we'll get to the bottom of the mystery surrounding her disappearance. Well, based on the evidence so far, Tom King, who is a senior archaeologist for Tighar, they got everybody, believes that Earhart and Noonan could not find Howland, so they flew until they found Gardner Island and landed safely on the edge of the reef. At that point, the tide was very low. They camped nearby, visited the plane, and sent out radio signals, even though nobody ever got those radio signals. As the tide got higher over several days, the plane floated out and eventually sank. So this guy's trying to explain away the, okay, well, if they managed to land on an island safely, that means the plane didn't crash. So where's the plane? This guy's explaining it with the tide just took a whole ass plane out. That's why the Navy didn't see it right after, you know, in the literal days after they disappeared and searched the island. The island has no running water, so while Earhart and or Noonan might have lived for a little while, they did probably end up dying of thirst, if that is in fact where they landed. So, how do we feel? Uh, you know, well, if you're hoping that I was going to bust out the red string and cork board, you are probably going to be disappointed. I think that Amelia and Fred... They probably went off course because it was overcast. He was using celestial navigating. Remember, he's both of them were telling uh, the Navy destroyer that we're literally right over top of you. And they're like, no, you're not. I don't know where they were. But I think at some point they went off course. It was overcast and they ran out of fuel. I think the plane crashed into the water. I realize that's the most obvious explanation, but it's also probably the correct one. I don't think those bones that were found and eventually lost belong to Amelia Earhart because, again, if the plane landed safely enough for them to have survived, where the hell is it? Please don't give me that the tide pulled it away bullshit. That is not true. The Navy searched the entire island. They found nothing. And I doubt they'd miss an entire freaking plane. So this theory is just not cutting it for me. Uh, they have also, Tighar and multiple other organizations have searched all around that island. So if a tide just, you know, simply pulled the plane away, then it would have friggin' sank and somebody would have found it at this point. You think they didn't search right off the coast of the island? I'm sure they had that thought. Uh, also, the ocean scares the shit out of me. I just want you to know that. I'm not afraid of water. I can swim like swimming. I'm afraid of the fact that we literally have not explored the vast majority of the oceans. We have no idea what's down there in the depths. We physically aren't even capable of going down to the deepest parts of the ocean, nor are there machines that can get to the deepest parts. Like they are crushed by the pressure that exists down there. I don't, do we even know how far the oceans go down in certain places? That is not our territory. I feel like we've explored, explored space more at this point than we have our own oceans. We are trespassers in the habitat of creatures that would happily eat us. For all we know, a megalodon swallowed the entire plane. And just like good old Professor Jantz said, if you can't prove it didn't happen that way, then my claim stands. Thank you, Autumn, for telling the story of Amelia Earhart's disappearance and for bringing up your fear of the ocean, because I am the same. I actually just have a fear of any large body of water, but the ocean especially for all the reasons you listed and more. For Amelia, though, I always have been so fascinated by Amelia, especially as a little girl learning about the mark she made on history. I'm not sure why, though, but I was taught when learning about her that she died in a plane crash like my teacher taught us, 
It wasn't until I became older and the coconut crab theory became really popular on TikTok. I realized how many theories and mysteries are actually behind her disappearance. Her story is definitely one I have always wanted to learn more about, and I'm so glad you were here to tell us about it. As for my story, Dorothy Arnold doesn't have as common of a household name or as many theories, but her story truly interests me because it's just so odd the way things happened. Dorothy Arnold was an American socialite inspiring writer and heiress in the early 1900s. Dorothy Harriet Camille Arnold was born into a very respected and affluent family on July 1st, 1885. She was born and raised in Manhattan, New York, as the second child and oldest daughter to Mary Parks Arnold and Frances R. Arnold. Dorothy lived a very carefree and charmed life. She was born into a family who was not only wealthy, but had been on the New York City Social Register for generations. Her father, Francis, was a Harvard graduate and senior partner of F.R. Arnold & Co. Perfume & Cologne Imports. His work, along with the family's name, helped Dorothy get into prestigious schools such as the Valiant School for Girls. The Valiant was a private school to prepare girls for continuing education by focusing on physics, astronomy, and physiology with a special emphasis on the French language and art, including its own on-site art studio. She did all of her primary learning years here and then moved on to Bryn Mawr's College. This college is a women's liberal arts college in Bryn Mawr, Pennsylvania, that was actually founded the same year of Dorothy's birth, which means she attended the college in its very early years. Here, she graduated in 1905 at the age of 20 with a Bachelor's of Art in Literature and Language. After she had graduated from college, she moved back home with her parents to pursue her dream of becoming a professional writer, although this is kind of when her life met a bit of turbulence. When Dorothy was at college, she met a man by the name of George Grimson Jr., He had also come from an affluent family, but he was not who Dorothy's family wanted to see her with. The biggest issue for her family was the fact that George was 42 years old. He was about 20 years older than Dorothy, and her family did not like this at all. When her father was asked about why he wanted to keep the two apart, he said, I would have been glad to see her associate more with young men than she did, especially some young men of brains and position one whose professional or business would keep him occupied. I do not approve of young men that do not have anything to do. And despite this disapproval from her family, she snuck off to see George in Boston under the lie that she was going to see an old college friend. When her parents learned that she was sneaking off to Boston to be with George, they forbade her from seeing him ever again. But the two's romance did not end. They wrote letters to each other. Many of these letters, Dorothy talked about her disappointment in her career and the lack of support from her family. Dorothy's parents were not supportive of not only her relationship, but her goal to become a professional writer. In the spring of 1910, she began to pursue her dreams further. She started by submitting a short story to the McClure magazine. This is when she sadly got her first rejection letter, and she was met with teasing from her family which led her to start to pursue her dreams a bit more quietly and secretly. She set up a P.O. box to secretly correspond with the publishers that she was sending her stories to, even asking her father if she could have her own apartment for space to write, but he rejected this, telling her that any good writer should be able to write anywhere. She was heartbroken, and she wrote to George to tell him about the rejection and the teasing. Letters to George, though, would soon stop because on December 12th, 1910, Dorothy disappeared with no answers to where she could have gone. December 12th, Dorothy dressed in a blue tailored maid suit, a black velvet hat, a long blue coat, and a black fox muff to keep her hands warm. She paired this outfit with a matching set of earrings and a hat pin. Around noon that day, she told her mother she was going to go out shopping. She was in the market for a nice evening gown she needed for a party coming up. Her mother offered to join her for the day, but since her mother was sick, she told her to stay home and get some rest. After saying goodbye to her mother, she started her walk to the store to buy an evening gown, 
Along the way, she saw many people who were excited to see her and reported that she seemed to be in good spirits that day. The first one was at the park in Tilford store, Brentino bookstore, where she bought a comedy book called Engaged Girl Sketches by Emily Calvin Blake. She left that bookstore around 2 p.m. where she ran into her friend Gladdy King. Dorothy told Gladdy she was going to take a walk through Central Park and the two went their separate ways. Gladdy was the last person to actually have a confirmed sighting of Dorothy. That evening, Dorothy never arrived home for dinner, which was not normal for her. She was very precise on time and when she was going to be somewhere. They called around to friends of Dorothy to find her, but none of her friends were with her or had contact with her. Shortly around midnight on December 13th, a woman named Elsie Henry called to see if Dorothy had returned home, and Dorothy's mother told her that she had a headache, so she couldn't come to the phone. At this point, Dorothy hadn't returned home. In fact, she never did. But the Arnolds hid this from others to avoid any scandal. When Dorothy didn't return home or attempt to make any contact with her family by that next morning, they took matters into their own hands. Her father had contacted a family friend and a lawyer named John S. Keith. John came to the home and he searched Dorothy's room. He found no important or personal belongings are missing from her room. He found nothing was out of place, and it seemed like nothing was really missing. He only found some burnt papers in the fireplace, thought to be rejection letters, and brochures for cruise ships going to Europe. John searched for Dorothy in every morgue, hospital, and shipport with no signs of her. This is when they made the decision to call George S. Dordery, the head of Pinkerton Detective Agency, to conduct a private investigation. The private investigators searched for a long six weeks, but they never found Dorothy. Around mid-January of 1911, the investigators finally suggested that the Arnolds contact the police. When Francis did reach out to the police, they advised that the Arnolds hold a press conference because Dorothy's case at this point needed what the family was trying to avoid, and that was the public. On January 29, 1911, reporters filled Francis Arnold's office to hear the press conference, during which the Arnold's family offered a $1,000 reward for the return of their daughter. The news of her disappearance made it on every single newspaper throughout America, and police began to receive thousands of tips and reported sightings of Dorothy. None of these ever panned out to be true or held enough evidence. Out of the search for Dorothy and the publication of her disappearance were some of the things that the Arnolds feared most. They received two ransom notes asking for $5,000 to return Dorothy, and they began to receive threats against their other daughter, Marjorie. These all turned out to be hoaxes. Um, The only thing that may have held up was sent to them about a month after the press conference in February of 1911, a postcard arrived to the Arnold family home, postmarked from New York. It simply read, I am safe with Dorothy's signature. This appeared to be Dorothy's writing and the signature, but her father insisted that some author out there had just copied her penmanship and sent this postcard. There was a nationwide search for Dorothy, and it was intense, but it was not long. The Arnold family spent thousands to try to find Dorothy, but by Valentine's Day of 1911, they had made it very clear they believed that she was dead. When they made this statement, District Attorney Charles S. Whitman offered his assistance to the Arnold family, but Francis declined the district attorney. Thinking that Francis maybe misunderstood him, he explained further that he had intended to set any and all of his detectives on the case. Francis at that point begged him, please don't, please don't. We are not looking for Dorothy any longer. This is when the search for Dorothy ended. Francis Arnold died in July of 1922, believing that his daughter had been kidnapped and murdered on December 12, 1910. Francis held on to his theory that Dorothy was attacked during her walk in Central Park and dumped into a body of water. He said that he had two clues, which led him to believe that this was Dorothy's fate but he never identified the evidence publicly. He wanted police to drag the reservoir as well as the Central Park Lake, but both of these had been frozen over and had been for days before Dorothy's disappearance. 
Mary, her mother, never shared her own theories of Dorothy's possible death, but when she passed away in September of 1912, their will read, I have no provisions for my beloved daughter, Dorothy H. C. Arnold. I am satisfied that she is not alive. Now, of course, there are a number of theories and false confessions around any case, but especially one that hits the nation like Dorothy's did. Naturally, when something happens to a woman, especially one involved with a man, there's a number of people who turn their suspicions towards him. However, George was in Italy at the time of her disappearance, but before the police got involved, her family was very suspicious of George. On December 16, 1910, the family sent communications to George in Italy, asking if he had any idea where Dorothy went, assuming she may have told him if she left on her own or if she left to go be with him. George insisted he did not know where she was, but the Arnold family was not satisfied with this answer, and her mother Mary and her brother John traveled to Italy in January, in January of 1911 to talk to George face to face. They met him in a hotel room in Florence, Italy, and John questioned George very intensely. Under this pressure, George confessed his love and concern for Dorothy, but he denied any knowledge of where she could be. John then punched George square in the jaw before they left George and returned home. Police ultimately did rule out any involvement George may have in Dorothy's disappearance by confirming that he was in Italy when it happened. But could he have been involved in a different way? A theory started in 1914 that Dorothy may have died during an illegal abortion. This theory stemmed from the arrest of nurse Lucy Orr and Dr. C.C. Meredith and Lutz of Pittsburgh, who were running an illegal abortion clinic. According to Dr. Lutz, Dr. Meredith told him that he performed an abortion on Dorothy Arnold, which she did not survive. He then claimed to have cremated her in the hospital's incinerator. However, Dorothy went missing on December 12th, and just a few weeks before that on November 23rd, Dorothy spent Thanksgiving with her friend Theodosa Bates in Washington, D.C., on the 24th, Dorothy had complained that she wasn't feeling well, which made her friend concerned. Dorothy then shared with her friend that she was just on her period. I don't think we have the time to get into the female anatomy and the fertility science and science of reproduction, but it's very unlikely that if she had a period the week of November 24th, that she would be pregnant on December 12th, especially when George was in Italy. The last of George's suspected was from a confession of a man named Edward Glenorris, who was serving time in Rhode Island State Prison for extortion. In April of 1916, he converted to Christianity in prison, and he simply wanted to confess his sins. During this, he claimed that an acquaintance of his asked him to transport an unconscious woman from New Rochelle, New York, to a house in West Point. There, he met two men, one named Doc, who was dressed very finely, and this is who people believe would be George. On the drive to this house, his acquaintance, Little Louie, told him that the unconscious woman was Dorothy Arnold. Then the next day, Little Louie called him up to tell him that Dorothy had died. He was then paid $250 by the man he called Doc to bury Dorothy in the basement of a house. Police went to this house that fit the description of Edward's confession they went to the area of the basement where he claimed to have buried her. Police did find an area of broken cement, but it was too small for her body. And the new owners of the house said the hole was made to access a gas pipe. After a little bit of digging around, it revealed two gas pipes, but no signs of Dorothy or any human remains. As for other theories, many believe she may have just simply left on her own accord to live her life out in private. Others believe she may have taken her own life after experiencing a lot of disappointment and failure in her career, and some turn their suspicion towards her family and their strange behavior to kind of hide her disappearance and ending the search so early on. Hopefully, one day we can find answers for what happened by possible DNA or remains. As you know, just what we have seen in 2022, we are finding more answers to unsolved cases with the advancement in technology and science. 
Well, thank you to Autumn for joining me today to put together such an interesting collaboration of stories. Thank you all for listening. If you are interested in learning more about Mitzi Mysteries or Autumn Odysseys, links to all of our important social medias and websites will be in the episode description, along with a link to the website for the Darkcast Network, which I can proudly say we are both lucky to be a part of. For now, I am wishing you all the best. Thank you for listening with us today and supporting both our podcasts.